morning, church. Let's stand and worship together this beautiful Sunday. this morning, church. Let's take a minute and greet your neighbor with the love of Christ. Well, as you make your way back to your seats, please remain standing with me as you're able. We're going to profess our faith together using the words of the Apostles' Creed as our guide. Will you join me? I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, 
who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. The third day he rose from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sitteth at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. You may be seated. Well, good morning, church. It is so wonderful to see all of you here this morning. If we haven't had the chance to meet yet, my name is Zach. I'm one of the pastors here at Covenant. Welcome to worship. If you are new to Covenant, an especially warm welcome to you. Uh, in the seat backs in front of you, you'll find two cards. The first of those cards is a prayer card. Uh, that card is there because we truly believe that God answers prayers, and we want to come alongside of you in those prayers. Each and every prayer card that gets submitted gets prayed over individually by our prayer team, our staff, our pastors. We want to come alongside of you in the prayers of your heart and your community, so you can fill out a prayer card and offer it up in that way. The other card says, I'm new, and if you are new to Covenant, this card is a great first step. Look, I, I don't know what brought you in here this morning if you're new to Covenant. Maybe you just moved to the area and the top of your list was to find a, a place to plug in, a church. Uh, maybe you've been in the community forever and you've driven past hundreds of times and just decided finally, you know what, I'm going to see what this place is all about. Maybe you don't know what you're looking for, but you're hoping maybe a church has it. Uh, whatever the reason you're here, I'm so glad that you are, and we want, as a church, to help you find what you're looking for. On the I'm New card, there's a space to offer up some contact information. If you do that and place it in the offering plate later in worship, it would be my honor to reach out to you and just begin connecting with you and helping you find whatever you're here for. Uh, both of the cards, prayer card and I'm New card, can be placed in the offering plate later in worship. Two quick invitations for us this morning. The first is that it is time to start thinking about our annual crawfish Boil. There's going to be some pictures on the screen behind me. Crawfish Boil is an event we have every year. It is so much fun. It's so tasty. Anybody big crawfish? Who's like a crawfish cultist in the room? Okay, so Crawfish Boil is super fun. Zydeco music, not as fun in my opinion, but uh, the whole community of Creekside comes together for this event. This is one of our biggest outreach events of the year that we don't have any connection with, who've never been in these walls, come to Crawfish Boil. And so um, it is important for us as a church to go, not only to enjoy crawfish, to enjoy building community with each other, uh, to go as an outreach to the community. So I hope you'll snag the QR code and sign up. Uh, crawfish is limited, so don't delay in registering for how much crawfish or Chick-fil-A you're going to order. Um, <laughs> for the non-crawfish people in the room. Uh, next, I'm super excited to uh, allow Mike Unleashed out. You may have noticed he came out of the drum booth. Our brother Mike Creel is going to share a story about his involvement in a small group. Will you welcome Mike with me? Don't be afraid. It's okay. I'm, I'm fairly calm. I'm not going to just freak out and drum solo all over him. <laughs> So I'm Mike Creel. Many of you know me. I've been around here since the second preview service, I think. So, uh, you know, back when we were meeting at the Y and had a different kind of drum cage there. We have this beautiful thing that Doug's built for me now. So really love that. Um, you may not know me directly. You might know my wife, too. Jen's one of the co-directors for Cub Kids. Um, yeah. yeah. Yeah, that is exactly what I was hoping you would do. Thank you. Happy Valentine's Day, dear. <laughs> it's nice to feel appreciated. So, um, Jen and I were talking a little bit yesterday as I was getting ready to come up and talk to you about small groups. And I, I can tell you a lot of things about small groups um, from having been involved in them uh, for several years, but at different times. It's an ebb and flow kind of thing. Um, Right now, we are involved in a small group here at Covenant, and I want to offer up, like, like Zach said, I, I don't want to tell you about small groups. I, it's a little tough because I want to tell you about my heart. 
I want to tell you about how important small groups are in our life. So here's a thing about what we're doing right now. I, I'm obviously a little nervous, but I'm doing okay. I don't mind standing in front of y'all. Man, there's a lot of you out there. And <laughs> some of us know each other pretty well. A lot of us, though, not so much. I don't know, for example, what's going on in your life. For your life, you probably don't know what's going on in mine. A small group can fix that, though. This is awesome. Don't get me wrong. We get great messages. You might guess I'm a little partial to the band. But um, it is a great experience for drawing closer to God. But a small group gives us a different opportunity. So let me tell you about that a little bit. Let me tell you why we love our small group so much. So the group that we're in started back in August. And we started meeting at a person's house um, bunch of people that I knew about as well as, frankly, I know some of you. Um, there were a couple of people in there that we knew, but n not somebody, most of the folks we weren't really close with. And so we come into the first meeting. Um, everybody kind of goes around and introduces. We do a really, I think, an interesting thing that, that starts leading you towards sharing your heart. And what we did, so we had a, a specific question that Zach, who was leading us at that point, um, asked us to answer. And it simply put, it's from 1 to 10, uh, how close do you feel to God? And there are a lot of different answers. Um, folks that didn't know each other that well, some were kind of conservative. You know, I was a 2 or a 3, you were a 7. Uh, Zach made a great point that I 100% agree with. The 8s, 9s, 10s, those are lots of times really special times. Um, love to be sitting in 10 all the time. But so here's the thing about small groups. You can be very real in them, and lots of times we don't maybe sit there at a 10 with Christ. Um, frankly, I, I'm pretty sure the first day I was a 3. And a lot of that was nerves because I, I didn't know many of the people there. The conversation, at least for me, because I, I don't want to out anybody else. So the conversation for me was mostly me talking about work. It was pretty safe. I have a really great job that I actually love. The people in my small group might be surprised to hear that. <laughs> but I do. I, I, I really I love my job, and yet, of course, there are things, you know, things that could be better. And so, so it was easy to talk about some of that. I think... To my best recollection, it was either the third or fourth week, I even, I, I just passed. I'd had a bad day at work and um, uh, just didn't feel like talking. And I'll tell you something about that real quick, too. Totally safe to do that. It was not a big deal. It, uh, I didn't feel like I was letting anybody down. Everybody knew. It, I mean, it was obvious. I was sitting there kind of head down, you know, passed. And... People started praying for me. It, it was awesome. Three, four weeks in, not a lot of relationship yet, and people knew there was a problem, and they jumped on it. Then the, the next thing that I would tell you about is, it, it's again, some of this is kind of hard for me to talk about. Hopefully it's easy to listen to. Mm -hmm. um, it was a few weeks later than that, uh, or a few weeks after that. Um, our daughter actually had our, first grandbaby uh, a few weeks ago, and, uh, uh, you know, strangely enough, she keeps referring to him as her first child, not our first grandbaby, <laughs> but um, we were, you know, it was a little bit before the birth, and we were nervous. We are down here. She's clear up in Denton on the north side of Dallas. We were concerned, are we going to be able to get there, and how's this going to work out? What are all the logistics? And, of course, praying for this situation, very stressful. Um, I shared that with the group, and just, just that we were kind of stressful, but then it went further, and this, is, this was the day, I can clearly tell you, that I shifted from head thinking about the small group into heart thinking about the small group, because I got, <laughs> I'm doing it again, I got really upset about my daughter living a long ways away, and then I thought about our elder son who's over in Austin. He just um, graduated from UT in the spring, and he's not, we, we don't get to see him very much. And then I got to thinking about our youngest son, who's in school clear back in Virginia, and 
uh, frankly, I got kind of weepy. Um, I miss my kids, and I miss them right now, and that's why it's, it's bugging me a little bit. But I shared that with the folks, and without exception, it's like everybody's like, yeah, I get that, sure. And, and some of the folks in our group have very young kids, and they're getting a glimpse of, oh, yeah, better enjoy this time, right? And it was just, it was a really special time. It was this bonding kind of time of sharing that kind of detail with this group of folks. And even, I'll say one more thing quickly, as we got close to Christmas, I was at a point where I was sharing with this group some things that, um, like a lot of you, I'm sure, sometimes the holidays can be kind of a dark time, and I'm, I'm one of those people. And there's some burden that I set down, and then I pick it back up again just almost regularly. And certainly around the holidays, I, I get those holiday blues. So talking through that with folks, getting their support, knowing that they were praying for me on Christmas Day, which is the hard day for me. It's, it's just outstanding. It's just exceptional to get to draw close with some folks. So that's a lot of what being in a small group is like. I can understand being, you know, a little bit hesitant to get out and share, but I, I encourage you, press through it. There are so many things that you get out of being in a small group. I, I wrote up a summary, and I'm going to look at my notes actually now because I haven't very much so far. Here's the things that I want to make sure you know, though. Small groups are all about connection. They're about caring. They're about trust. They're about knowing you can count on folks around you. It's really encouraging in your small group to hear somebody else talking about something that went well in their day, their life, whatever. It's really especially encouraging if it's something that you've been praying about with them for a while and you see God working in the situation. Sometimes even if they don't, it's so, so cool. And then there's that opportunity when somebody shares something that is a little rough, something that they're struggling with, a burden they're carrying. And you get to lift them up. You get to support them through prayer throughout the week, of course, but even right there in the meeting, numerous times we have stopped, we have laid hands on people to pray a little bit. Uh, we have offered feedback from our experience, and at times there's been just clear word from God that he spoke to somebody about a situation and they can speak up and, and offer some insight. The power of somebody who's gone through these things before is incredible. It's so great to be able to share. And so that's the last point. When you share yourself and somebody comes alongside you, a brother, sister in Christ, it, it, it is just exceptional. It helps get you through. All of this is great. But without the connection that comes through small group, I'm not sure that you can feel Christ in your life um, to the depth that he's there for us. So I just want to encourage you all, small groups are the way to go. I'm going to go back to my cage now. Uh, so Mike said it best, I'm not going to add many words, but there is a small group for you here. And my, I guess my unique invitation to you is that I know it can be intimidating to think about showing up to a place where there's a group of people that you might not know or not know very well. Here's the invitation for you if that's the, what you're thinking right now. Show up and try it. You have full freedom, as Mike said, to show up and not share anything. You can be a fly on the wall at a small group meeting. Uh, and you can come and just give it a try. Say, I'm going to commit to four weeks. I'm going to show up four weeks in a row and give it a try. And if it's not something that's for you after that, you're, you're free. You get a full refund. Um, <laughs> give it a try. There's a QR code. We have groups on Sunday right after worship, Tuesday night. And we're launching a new group on Thursday nights here in the community. It starts on Leap Day, February 29th. So I know your calendars are open because... You can't schedule stuff on leap day. It only happens every four years. Uh, so if you're interested in being a part of Sunday, Tuesday, or the new plant uh, on leap day on Thursday nights, I hope you'll just sign up and give it a shot.
come and see what it's all about. As we continue worship, let's go to God in prayer. Lord, you're in this place, and that's what matters. We're here to connect with you, to glorify your name. Please bless our discipleship ministries, our small groups, the new group launch that you would bring people to be a part of it, uh, who you have prepared for this moment, this season. And we pray, Lord, that our praises would be pleasing to you. We know they are. It's in great love we pray. Amen. Amen. Well, church, this space and this place together uh, is a space of freedom. And so we invite you in this time as we continue in worship to take whatever posture necessary to meet honestly and authentically with the Lord. I searched the world, but it couldn't fill me. And treasures that fade are never enough. Then you came along and put me back together. And every desire is now satisfied here. Turn shame into glory. You're the only. 
time again You have proven You do just what you say Though the storms may come And the winds may blow I'll remain steadfast And let my heart learn When you speak a word It will come to pass Great is your faith
Father, we're so grateful that even though you know all our failures, all our flaws, your mercy and your grace always seem to find us. God, you're faithful. We put our hope in you. We trust you. Church, join me now in saying the prayer that Jesus taught us to pray. Saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom the power and the glory forever. Amen. Amen. You can have a seat and kids, you're dismissed. Y'all can head back to Cove Kids. I hope you have a great time. Real quick, real quick before reading the scripture for this morning, I want to give you an update. Uh, we, as you likely remember, are in the midst of a, our stewardship season, our annual giving drive. Uh, last Sunday was Commitment Sunday. All, all the members of the church come together. We have an, an expectation of membership that we make a pledge to the work of the ministry, that the work and ministry that God is doing here through us and in this community. And so I want to give you an update. Last Sunday was a beautiful, beautiful Commitment Sunday. We're one week in uh, post -ple uh, Commitment Sunday, and it's been one of the best Commitment Sunday weeks we've ever had. Uh, we are, as of today, sitting at 69 pledges, totaling $510,000 uh, and some change. Uh, so we can celebrate that. A quick word, our goal for this year in stewardship is to raise pledge dollars of $650,000. So we have had an incredible start, and we uh, need to continue leaning in to reach our goal, the goal that we believe the Lord has given us for the ministry uh, of this upcoming fiscal year. Just two invitations. If you have a pledge with us from last year, but you haven't made a pledge this year, uh, my invitation to you is that you would prayerfully consider submitting a pledge for the 24-25 fiscal year. You can do that online or in the Church Center app. Uh, and then if you have been giving to the church, but you don't have a pledge or, or you want to explore giving to the church, I want to invite you to make a first-time pledge. Pledging is what our finance team uses to set the budget for the year, and so every pledge helps. We don't want to, to plan to spend what we don't plan to receive. We want to be faithful with the resources God has given us, so pledging is what helps to make that possible. Uh, let us now, if you have your Bible, turn to the Gospel of Matthew in God's Word for us this morning. We'll be reading from Matthew chapter 27, and we'll read a few verses, picking up in verse 45. Receive now the Word of the Lord. From noon... Until three in the afternoon, darkness came over all the land. 
About three in the afternoon, Jesus cried out in a loud voice, Eli, Eli, lema sabachthani, which means, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? When some of those standing there heard this, they said, he's calling Elijah. Immediately, one of them ran and got a sponge. He filled it with wine vinegar, put it on a staff, and offered it to Jesus to drink. The rest said, now leave him alone. Let's see if Elijah comes to save him. And when Jesus had cried out again in a loud voice, he gave up his spirit. At that moment, the curtain of the temple was torn in two from top to bottom. The earth shook. The rocks split. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Thank you for reading uh, that. And uh, what a what a rich passage of scripture. And... Um, uh, we'll dig into that, but before we do, I want to uh, to turn our attention also to uh, to our theme verse for this year. It's in Second Corinthians three eighteen, and and I want to remind us why we've been on this journey throughout the beginning of this year. So uh, if, if you're new, if this is your first Sunday at Covenant, you'll be able to uh, to catch up on a quick fast forward so that we could be deeply. Uh, rooted and prepared to receive this word from Matthew 27. Our theme verse for the year is 2 Corinthians 3.18, and it reads, And all of us, with unveiled faces, seeing the glory of the Lord as though reflected in a mirror, are being transformed into the same image from one degree of glory to another. For this comes from the Lord, the Spirit. Did you hear that? All of us with unveiled faces uh, see this this image of the Lord, the glory of the Lord, and then we reflect it out into the world. it's, It's a call to transformation. It's an invitation to be transformed so that our image would be a reflection of the mirror image of God. But all of this begins... Uh, with the truth that those of us who are in Christ Jesus our Lord have unveiled faces. Uh, there, there is nothing that divides us or separates us from the glory of the Lord, that that magnificent glory is able to, uh, to, to transform us and then be reflected in us into the world. And so this this unveiled faces, this understanding of the glory, that's where we've been. And we've been, we've been rooted in the reality that the glory of the Lord is awesome and powerful and, and, and dangerous, in fact. And, and we have to be uh, a humble stewards of this glory and understand what God uh, is able to do whenever we interact with him and to understand the imbalance that exists between us as sinful creatures and, and God who is a sinless, righteous God and, and that in that imbalance is where the danger comes and that we have from God a, a mediated interaction with the glory of God and that mediated interaction came through the priest and it also came through the veil, this veil that uh, was set up uh, to 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 uh, to to mediate and mitigate the danger of the glory of the Lord, particularly in the temple worship for the Jewish people. This veil between the most holy place and the people of God, and so we arrive today at. At, at this passage of uh, Matthew 27 and an understanding of what has taken place uh, with the veil and what is now available to us in Christ Jesus. And so I'm really excited to, to gather together around this word. Let's bow for a moment of prayer together. Father God, we come into this space and time uh, thankful for your word. 
thankful for the opportunity we have to hear from you. Lord, we maybe all too often take for granted the fact that you have a word for us here in your scriptures. Lord, we don't take that for granted this morning. We are collectively humbled that you would see fit to speak to us. That you love us so much, care for us so much, that you provide a word uh, in your scriptures for us that we might know uh, our place and position with you and who you are as a loving God that makes a way. Lord, I ask that you would open our eyes, that we would see our ears, that we would hear. Open our minds that we come to know and understand your word, our hearts, that we would feel its power. And I pray, Almighty God, that you would open our hands. Then in response, we would offer grace to the world. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. I find it so fascinating uh, how far things have come with technology. Uh, Do you remember the day before TiVo? Like the days of life before TiVo. And now I say TiVo and I already sound dated, right? Uh, because now it's not just the idea that there's this one application TiVo that could record uh, act, uh, different programs on TV, but now everything's on demand, everything's at our hand, and if, if you wanted to, uh, to talk about something that's happening in real time, you better ask whether or not they've seen it. I mean, think about what it is to, to have a sporting event going on and be recording it at home, and, and, you're, and you're, you're wanting to be sure that no one disturbs that sanctity of a fresh view, and, and, and you're, you're walking in a crowd of people, and you hear them start to talk about the big game, and they're about to a break for you, who's going to win? And all of a sudden, you say, no, 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 like you want to be sure that you don't find out this uh you you don't want the spoiler for the game Uh, i don't know if you you saw but um taylor swift indeed landed in lax and is going to make it to the game by the way i could have told you three weeks ago taylor was going to make it to the game Uh, There were concerns that Flight 24 was going to crash as a system of the internet, as hundreds of thousands of people are tracking Taylor from Tokyo to LAX and then on to Vegas. God bless us. (laughs) What? Okay, that's who we are. We need to accept that. That's a cultural phenomenon that we need to be confronted with in order for us to move on to perfection together in Christ. So, you know, but but look, I could tell you how this game is going to end. Travis Kelsey is going to score a touchdown to put the Chiefs up, and Taylor's going to come down on the field, and she's going to cry, and then she's going to kiss him, and it's going to be a moment in American history. Okay? Um, So if you didn't like uh, to find out, uh, if you don't like to find out about games before, I'm sorry, it just happened. You just found out. That's what's going to happen. Um, And we're all going to wonder if the NFL has become the WWE. Um, Oh, oh, and a proposal. Kelsey's going to drop to a knee. Okay, thanks, John. I I didn't get, yeah, uh, sorry, I didn't didn't read the rest of the NFL script on that one. Um, (laughs) Yeah, so, and so I, I understand that here today uh, in February, uh, as we read Matthew 27 and we read a, a, a Good Friday text, this is a Good Friday text. This is, this is Jesus' death, his, his sacrifice on the cross uh, that, that, that prepares us for Easter. Uh, that, that seems maybe out of order. But, but in reality, that's all of the Christian life as we move through the seasons of our faith calendar. As we prepare uh, for Christmas through Advent, we already know that Jesus was born. 
And as we begin the season of Lent this Wednesday at Ash Wednesday, and we have this 40-day preparation season heading towards Easter, I know that it might seem as though uh, there's some inappropriate foreshadowing of what is to come for us as we read Matthew 27 today. And yet, I would say that this is the most perfect of moments for us to be confronted yet again with Jesus' sacrifice because it is at that very moment, this moment in preparation for Lent where we're able to be reminded of what our focus is on throughout this season. We are preparing to receive Christ's sacrifice and ultimately his gift of life at Easter. And so we're able to stop and rest here for a moment in Matthew 27 that Jesus died for us. Did you hear that in Matthew 27 verse 50? 2750, again, Jesus cried out in a loud voice, and it says he gave up his spirit. It's, it's such beautiful language and imagery that's able uh, to resonate for us. He gave up his spirit, and, and along with the giving up of his spirit, the giving up of his physical life, he also is giving of his spirit, the Holy Spirit, releasing it into the world so that the glory of the Lord is now able to be known not only uh, in, in, uh, in the personhood of Jesus, but now in the intimacy each and every one of us have with the Father through the working of the Holy Spirit. He gave up his spirit and gave of his spirit to the world, to you, and to me. And then and it, it's, it's such uh, an interesting moment, and, and I didn't tell Pastor Zach that I was going to do this, so the way that he read the text uh, resonated so powerfully for me because the Holy Spirit aligned those things for us. He was very clear as he read, uh, as, as I am, that at that moment, things changed. In verse 51, if you have your Bibles, you could underline that. Verse 51, it says, At that moment, at that moment, the curtain of the temple was torn in two from top to bottom. At that moment, the world would never be the same. The the, the availability of a relationship with God, the intimacy of God, the, the, the glory of the Lord that is now with us changed at that moment. And we, we might want more. Gospel writer Matthew, tell us more. The curtain of the temple was torn in two. You're going to leave it at that? What does that mean? I mean, it seems, to, it seems to, to, to leave us hanging with greater longing for detail and understanding about what it means that at that moment the curtain would be torn. So we're going we're gonna to turn together to, to Hebrews. Hebrews chapter 9, we, we, were, uh, we spent some time in, in this series in Hebrews chapter 9, but we're going to to turn our attention back there, and we're going to proceed on through this teaching. Beginning in verse 11, we ended at verse 10 lastly, but now we're going to begin at verse 11 and just read through verse 15. And, and all of this, everything that's described in 11 through 15 of Hebrews 9 is all contained in Matthew 27, 51's at that moment. At that moment, let's hear what took place. But when Christ came as a high priest of the good things that are now already here, he went through the greater, more perfect tabernacle that is not made with human hands. That is to say, it's not a part of this creation. He did not enter by means of blood of goats and calves, but he entered the most holy place for all, By his own blood, thus obtaining eternal redemption. 
the blood of goats and bulls, the, ash, the ashes of a heifer sprinkled on those who are ceremonially unclean, satisfied them so that they are outwardly clean. How much more then will the blood of Christ, who through the eternal spirit offered himself unblemished to God, cleanse our consciences from acts that lead to death so that we may serve the living God. For this reason, Christ is the mediator of a new covenant that those who are called may receive the promised eternal inheritance now that he has died as a ransom to set them free from the sins committed under the first covenant. Now, I know that that's a theological treatise, and uh, partway through it, all of you said, okay, I'm going to need some time here. Like, that's like reading Romans. We could preach one sermon per verse of this section of Hebrews. I'm not going to do that all this morning for you. But I am going to walk through a few things at that moment, things that we know happened. At that moment, Jesus uh, is clearly the great, the great high priest. Verse 11, Jesus is the great high priest. Priest. So now the, the, the mediators, of the, the priests that would enter into the temple on behalf of the people, Jesus entered in on behalf of all people. Not just the people of Israel, on behalf of all people, Jesus entered in. So first, Jesus is the great high priest. Second, in, in verse 12, and this is so critical for us, the, 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 the authority upon which Jesus entered in. It's no longer as was for the priest of old through the blood of animals and through the sacrifice of animals. But rather, Jesus' sacrifice is himself. The blood that is offered is no longer the blood of animals, but it is his own blood. Offered as an atoning sacrifice for all of us. At that moment, as Jesus died, he became the sacrifice that would satisfy the needs of the world. You and I are able to approach because we have a high priest willing to make the ultimate sacrifice on our behalf. Then verse 14, verse 14, it says that, that this, this sacrifice that Jesus made was actually an unblemished sacrifice. And I know that that might seem like a nuanced detail that we would just overlook or gloss over, but, but rather it's so very important that Jesus is the sinless lamb, that, uh, that, that we must not get it twisted. Jesus was without sin as he was both fully God and fully man in his, uh, in his uh, personhood of the Trinity, he is indeed perfect, righteous, sinless, and so he comes as an unblemished sacrifice. That's critical because it reminds us that you and I are not capable of approaching God because we are blemished, we are sinful, and we are unworthy, but Christ, who is absolutely worthy, would offer himself for you and for me the ultimate sacrifice. And then finally, verse 15, it gives the purpose statement. Why is all this happening? Why is he the great high priest that enters through self-sacrifice that is an unblemished, holy gift of atonement? Verse 15, it says, he died as a ransom to set us free from our sins. This gift sets us free from our sins, that we are no longer bound to the consequences of our sin, that we're no longer, uh, that we're no longer uh, clearly unworthy before the Lord, but rather we are made worthy through the gift of Christ. This is a transformational reality that he died for our sins. What an unbelievable moment in history. What an unbelievable moment when Christ died for you and for me. 
devaluation is such an interesting thing. Uh, I know that some of you have calculated that when you we go to buy a car, do you want to buy a new car and you drive it off the lot and immediately you lose thousands of dollars? God bless you. Also, devaluation is so interesting with electronics. I mean, uh, you buy a new computer for $2,000, and in five years, it's worth less than zero. You have to pay someone to get rid of it. You buy a TV, and uh, God, uh, it's, you know, it's a mess. Uh, it's so interesting to watch how things devalue, uh, and it's also interesting to see how the veil devalues in a moment. The veil is of critical importance. It's an ornate tapestry that has significance and purpose for the people of Israel, for all people, that this most holy place would be protected. It is of the highest value because it provides that mediating force between God's power and our vulnerability. And in a moment, in a flash, it is worthless. The veil is worthless, not because it's torn in two, but because Jesus paid the price. That veil, the veil which I showed the picture of, uh, a, a, a projection of what it might have looked like, that beautiful, ornate veil is nothing but a filthy rag. Worthy of the trash heap. Why? Because God so loved the world that he gave his only son that whoever believes shall not perish but have eternal life. Brothers and sisters, when we when we read this story through, whenever we see the impact of that moment in history on the world, that the earth shook and that the veil was torn, even the non-believer, even the heathen, even the one that would be willing to, uh, to beat and mock and scorn and crucify Jesus, a very Roman centurion could look on that moment in history and say, surely this man was the son of God. Surely this man, this man that would offer his life was the son of God. And for us to look on that moment in history and say, I believe that as well. I no longer want to be divorced from, separated from God, but I want an intimate relationship with God where God draws near to me and I draw near to him, where he anoints me with the power and presence of the Holy Spirit, where his glory is no longer contained, but now it lives and breathes and have its, has its life in me so that I I could then reflect the glory of the, the, the Lord to the world. What a profound invitation that at that moment, you and I were all invited in. This holy of holies that was separate and contained in order for us to be protected is now open for all. The veil has been torn, and you are invited in. You are invited into relationship with God in an unfiltered way through the power of the blood of Christ. I want you to be invited today. I'm inviting you. The Lord's inviting you. The Lord's inviting you into a deeper relationship with him. For some of you, you've been walking with the Lord for years, but, but it might seem as though there's still a filter there, as though there's still a veil there, as though the glory of the Lord isn't fully known, as though your encounter with Jesus uh, seems to be restrained or constrained. Uh, that invitation for you is to, to acknowledge that the veil is torn and Jesus is with you, with us. So that invitation for you is, Lord, I surrender. I surrender my whole self to you. 
For some of you, you've been, you've been observing this Christian uh, faith from a distance. You've been studying it. You've been curious about it. Uh, maybe others around you have been convinced of it, but you have not been convinced. Uh, the invitation for you is, 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 do you want to experience freedom in the Lord today? Do you want to experience freedom that comes with understanding that you're no longer bound by the sins of your life, but rather you are set free to live and have your being with God in community with one another? So I'm going to lead us into a time of prayer and and, and I, I invite you wherever you are with your walk with the Lord, if if you want to just uh, kneel before the Lord, if you want to hold your hands open and surrender, if you want to come to the altar in prayer, we're going to spend some time in prayer acknowledging the grand gift of this sacrifice and that Jesus is inviting us deeper at that very moment, at this very moment, at this very moment, Christ is inviting us. Let's not miss a moment. Let's not miss this moment. Let's see what the Lord is doing in our midst. Let's pray together. Father, we come before you. We come before you acknowledging the significance of that moment, acknowledging the significance of this moment. With our hearts open, with our hands open, with our physical knees bent or our spiritual knees bent, Lord, we fall before you, O God. We fall before you in reverence and in honor. God, that you would that you would come for me I just don't understand it I'm nothing and yet you love me I'm broken and yet and yet you want to fix me I'm hurting and yet you're offering me healing. I know nothing but chaos, and yet you're comforting me. Lord, you invite and you invite us and we respond. You invite us to draw near and so we respond by taking a step towards you by 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 drawing near to you and saying Lord thank you thank you for this extravagant gift of your love Jesus thank you for taking on my sin bearing them on your cross, dying my death, that I might live. Father, we, we receive this gift of life. We receive this gift of joy. And we come uh, before you in praise and thanksgiving, proclaiming so clearly that this one Jesus is indeed the Son of God. This one Jesus is my Savior and my Lord. We, we collectively cry out to you, O God, renew us, restore us, redeem us. We pray that we might be made one with you, Father, Son, and Spirit, that we might participate in your goodness and in your joy and in your hope and in your love. Lord, you've invited us in, and we've responded. 
We are yours. And you are ours. So be it. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. As we continue in, in worship together, um, it's, a gift of, it's a gift of an opportunity of response, response to what the Lord has done in our lives. That's why we have uh, offerings. We offer in response, acknowledging what the Lord has done in us and amongst us and say, Lord, thank you, thank you, and we honor you. We honor you with our offerings. And so uh, we're going to invite the Lord to, uh, to be honored in our offerings as we invite the ushers to come forward at this time. Let's continue in a spirit of worship together. Will you stand with us while we worship together in our final song?
so richly blessed with the worship leadership that we have here at Covenant, aren't we? Let's give God a hand clap of praise for what he's doing in your lives. It's pretty amazing. Uh, one reminder before the benediction, this Wednesday is Ash Wednesday. It's also Valentine's Day, but it is Ash Wednesday, uh, 7 o'clock here in this space. We're going to, to worship and begin our journey of Lent. I hope that you'll join us and make that a priority. It's going to be a gift as uh, we prepare for what God does this year in Lent. I receive this benediction. Lord, we go forth from this place, acknowledging that you have torn the veil in two uh, by the gift and sacrifice of our Savior. And so with that joy, with that awareness, with the understanding that the glory is now accessible and, and is able to be reflected through us, Lord, we go on mission, on purpose to engage with the world for your sake in honor and glory and praise to you. In Jesus' name we go. Amen. Peace be with you, brothers and sisters.